Hello and welcome to Bio Lessons to Go. I'm Mr. Dove and today we'll be looking at biotechnology and recombinant DNA technology. Biotechnology is the use of organisms to perform a practical task for humans. The earliest applications of biotechnology occurred during prehistoric times. Um, early humans, as we do today, would selectively breed plants and animals to produce organisms that might yield additional product. For example, the ancestor of our modern ear of corn was selectively bred, choosing those individuals that had the most uh, kernels per ear of corn and allowing them to reproduce and pass that trait on to the next generation. And over time, we were able to have our modern ear of corn produced. Additionally, um, early humans needed a way to have different uh, beverages and foods that could exist without refrigeration. The discovery of fermentation um, allowed for this, uh, making wines and cheeses that can exist outside of refrigeration. At the forefront of biotechnology today are the applications that analyze and manipulate the genes of organisms at the molecular level. The knowledge of genes can lead to advances in the treatment and diagnosis of various genetic disorders. In 1990, the Department of Energy and the National Institutes of Health began a project called the Human Genome Project, and the goal of this project was to map all the genes held within our chromosomes. They thought that the project was going to take a really long time, but fortunately, computer technology allowed for an acceleration in the project, and a rough map was completed in 2003, and work on the human genome still continues today. Here we have a cartoon diagram of chromosome number one and all of its 246 million base pairs. Labeled here are many of the traits that are associated with the genes carried by chromosome one. By identifying which chromosomes are associated with which traits and which genetic disorders, scientists can focus their efforts on those particular chromosomes and hopefully discover preventative measures and cures in the near future. The process, which took almost 13 years to create a rough map of the human genome, can be done today within just 24 hours for about $1,000. A hospital um, can get a rough map of an individual's genome so that they can search for particular mutations or changes in their genome that might indicate a reason for a particular disease. In addition to mapping the human genome, we've also mapped the genomes of many other organisms uh, to compare their genome to ours and to discover how their genes work as well. So, remember uh, Thomas Morgan's work on the fruit fly? Well, imagine if he had the information with the genome of the fruit fly with all 13,600 of their genes. So, using our knowledge of DNA, scientists have developed a set of techniques called recombinant DNA technology or genetic engineering. With genetic engineering, DNA is cut from one organism and inserted into another to produce a desired effect. Organisms who are produced through genetic engineering are called transgenic because they have foreign DNA. Trans refers to movement and genes, so we've moved the genes from one organism to another. As with any new technology, we need a proof of concept to not only show that it's going to work, but it's repeatable. Um, an example of this proof of concept can be seen when scientists took the green fluorescent protein uh, from the jellyfish Aquiora victoria and transferred it into the cells of a tobacco plant. Not only did the tobacco plant take up those genes, but they expressed the protein and it was able to glow under ultraviolet light. Since then, we were able to replicate that process by transferring the green fluorescent protein into a myriad of various organisms, from mice, to bunnies, to monkeys, to pigs. Most recently, a group of uh, Korean scientists were able to transfer the gene of the red fluorescent protein uh, into some cats. Not only did they express the gene, but then those individuals were cloned, so identical 
uh, clones were made from the cells of those cats. And the kittens produced as a result of that cloning experiment also contained those fluorescent protein genes, which shows that the modifications done to the genome were permanent to their genes and were passed to the clones. Now, this technology isn't very useful. It's simply a proof of concept. It simply adds novelty um, to our world of organisms to have something that glows. Although, a group of scientists w wishing to capitalize on this uh, glowing capacity of genetically engineered organisms um, have produced a group of uh, fish, which they call glow fish. And you can get those at national retailers like even Walmart, um, and you can have your own transgenic organism as a pet. But if genetic engineering is going to be a useful tool, it has to produce useful products. So here are just a few examples of some useful products that could be coming um, to a store near you. Um, one useful product is what we call golden rice in which um, genes for the precursors to the molecule that makes vitamin A are inserted. Um, this could be a useful product because in many parts of the world individuals are vitamin A deficient and without vitamin A at, at young age um, you can actually go blind and so the idea is, is that by producing this golden rice and then distributing it all across the world we can prevent childhood blindness as associated with vitamin A deficiencies. Um, we rely on corn as a staple in our diet. Um, corn is oftentimes predated upon by a corn borer, a little uh, caterpillar, a larval form of a beetle. Well, there's a bacteria called Bacillus thuringiensis, which produces a toxin which actually kills this uh, corn borer. And so by taking the DNA, the gene that codes for that particular toxic protein and inserting it, into the plant, it produces the toxin itself. So rather than spray um, our corn plants with pesticides, the corn has naturally been engineered to be resistant to the corn borer, and that's going to allow for more food for more people. Another uh, potentially useful product, a uh, group in Massachusetts is trying to bring this to market, what they call, uh, what is called sumo salmon. By inserting the genes from various other salmon as well as uh, some eel genes, it's able to grow much faster in a shorter period of time than its natural form. Um, and so the idea is we can produce a lot of food faster for people. Um, some of the big concerns with a lot of these genetically engineered organisms, though, is that what if they get released into the wild? Because that's part of their genome, if they were to interbreed with the natural uh, salmon, it would contaminate um, the traditional genetic stock and could lead to future problems. Um, another really interesting uh, thing that is on the forefront is the idea of biosteel. Spider silk is a very, very uh, te has a high tensile strength. And if we could get enough of it, perhaps we could weave it into various fibers. And so groups of scientists have actually um, inserted the gene for the production of spider silk into the milk producing uh, genes of goats. And the idea is, is that these goats would produce the spider silk protein. And if we can purify that and then spin that into fibers, we'd have really, really light and strong fibers so that you could even make um, a really light bulletproof vest, for example. Now, in order to do genetic engineering, we need certain tools. Um, if we're going to cut and paste DNA from one source into another, we need what uh, is tantamount to um, molecular scissors and molecular glue. So first, we have our DNA scissors. The DNA scissors, as I said, are called restriction enzymes. The restriction enzymes were isolated from bacteria. Now, bacteria will have these because they need to protect themselves from invading viruses, whose goal is to inject DNA, um, force the bacteria into producing new viruses, and then when the viruses come out of the bacteria, it'll destroy and kill that bacteria. So normally, um, our virus, like this little bacteriophage, would insert its DNA into the host. The host then must use that DNA 
to produce the, the small viral particles. And once the viruses are assembled, they're going to burst out of that bacteria. This is called the lytic cycle of uh, viral reproduction. Now, if the bacteria contains a restriction enzyme that's able to cut up DNA, the viral DNA will be destroyed, and so our bacteria will survive. Now, each of these restriction enzymes, of which there are hundreds, um, have a specific substrate. In this case, that specific substrate is a sequence of DNA bases. This specific sequence we call a restriction site, because this is a site where that DNA is going to be able to be cut by that restriction enzyme, also known as a restriction endonuclease. So in this case, um, our enzyme, ECOR1, is cutting the DNA at GAATTC, and it provides a specific cut. Now, some enzymes cut the DNA and they leave sticky ends, while others will leave what we call blunt ends. ECOR1, which we saw on the previous slide, when it cuts, it produces a sticky end. It recognizes a specific sequence, and when it cuts, it'll cut the covalent bonds on the DNA backbone, and then the hydrogen bonds will fall apart and leave overhanging bases that are unmatched. And that, that's really useful if we're wanting to stick two pieces of DNA together. Another enzyme also found from the same species of bacteria, uh, the fifth enzyme, discovered from that bacteria, when it cuts, it recognizes a specific site and will produce a blunt cut, um, cutting the covalent bonds right across from each other, causing the DNA to fall apart. Now once we've cut our DNA, we're going to want to glue it together in, into the host's DNA. And so the enzyme we use for that is ligase. It's the same enzyme that naturally glues together the Okazaki fragments, um, and so it's a perfect tool for sticking DNA together. Lastly, we need to have some way to transfer the DNA that we now have recombined into the host organism so that we can get that desired effect. So these things that transfer DNA are called vectors. Now, a vector can be a mechanical vector, or it can be a biological uh, vector. Um, an example of a mechanical vector is like a tiny needle, maybe smaller than a human hair, to be able to insert DNA into the nucleus of, say, a fertilized egg. If you're engineering a multicellular organism, it's almost impossible to insert DNA into all other cells, unless you start as a fertilized egg. Because with a fertilized egg, you have one cell and one nucleus. So with a tiny needle, you can insert that DNA and hope that some of that finds its way into the genome and then modifies that organism. Other vectors include biological ones, like viruses. Um, with a virus, you can engineer it so that it can infect the host and then do its job, inserting the DNA into the host organism. Um, we can also use bacteria. Um, in order to get the desired DNA into the bacteria, we would use what's called a plasmid. Now, a plasmid is a small ring of DNA that's found only in bacteria. Plasmid DNA is different than its uh, normal chromosome in that it's going to carry different genes um, that are not found on the larger chromosome. Uh, for example, the gene for antibiotic resistance. Here we have a map um, for a particular plasmid, a particular piece of DNA from a bacteria. This map shows um, some of those important genes like tetracycline resistance or ampicillin resistance. When scientists map these genes, um, they want to know where on the gene that certain enzymes are going to cut so that when we choose an enzyme we're going to be able to cut the DNA where we want so that we'll be inserting um, our desired DNA um, in such a way that we don't destroy the plasmid. It's interesting to note that it was plasmid DNA that was actually the transforming factor in Griffith's famous experiment. The heat killed smooth bacteria was able to pass on its 
uh, genetic instructions on how to build a protective coat encoded in their plasmid DNA. This allowed for the rough strain to build the protective coat and become virulent and kill the mouse. So let's look at an example of how DNA is inserted into a host using a plasmid by looking at how we might use this technology to produce insulin. The first step is to isolate um, the human DNA that we're in interested in. In this case, we're going to try to find the gene that's responsible for producing insulin. Um, and then we'll isolate a plasmid um, that we're going to use as our vector to insert that uh, foreign DNA into so that we can trick our bacteria into producing insulin. The next step is going to be to cut both samples using the same restriction enzyme. We want to use the same restriction enzyme because we want the cuts to match up when we glue them together. Our next step is going to be to combine the DNA fragments using that DNA glue ligase. Now at this point, the only thing we have is recombined instructions. We have our traditional bacterial plasmid with our inserted DNA. But outside of a host, it's just information. It can't do anything. So that's where our step four is so important, to put it back into our host bacteria so that it can then be read uh, transcribed by our messenger RNA and then translated into our desired protein at the ribosome by tRNA so that then we have our final end product which is insulin used to treat um, insulin dependent diabetes and if we look at the bottle we're going to discover that it says that it is indeed human insulin and it was produced through recombinant DNA technologies Biotechnology, specifically recombinant DNA technology, has a lot of potential positives. For example, treating illnesses um, like diabetes. But there are a lot of potential pitfalls and negatives that have to be considered before we embark on any use of any technology. All of the ethical considerations have to be considered such that the positives far outweigh the negatives when we implement any new technologies.